Sorry about that. It wouldn't let me unmute myself. So um, appreciate everybody being on. Uh, hope all is well. Tyler, your baby is super cute. Uh, super cute. Thank God he took after mom. Um, but uh, congratulations. I hope everybody is well. Obviously, you know, just finishing up uh, recruiting uh, this morning, which is what I'd call the late signing day. Um, I think the first signing day is the signing day, and this is the late signing day rather than calling it the early signing day and signing day. Um, really proud of the staff and, and what we've been able to do uh, throughout this entire process. <clears throat> Obviously, we're getting ready to kind of uh, turn the page and start on the next classes as well as uh, winter workouts and, and spring ball uh, and summer workouts. Obviously, we've got a lot of work to do, um, a lot of planning that's gone into all these things. But overall, I, I would like to thank the staff uh, for all the hard work that they put into this, um, specifically the recruiting staff, as, as well as the coaches. The recruiting staff probably doesn't get as much love. Um, you know, everybody's aware of the, you know, the coaches, but uh, the recruiting staff off the field have done a phenomenal job. Uh, one of our better classes. I think a big part of that is I do think it was a strong year in the state of Pennsylvania and a strong year in the region, which helps. You know, that always helps. Uh, obviously, it's the hard work of the staff, but um, if it's not a strong year in the state or a strong year in the region, that, that can make it challenging as well. So kind of the stars have to align a little bit for this to happen as well. Uh, but I am really proud of all the hard work that everybody put in. Um and I uh, look forward to answering you guys' questions. But really appreciate everybody being on and uh, very pleased with the class overall. Obviously, we still got some work to do, uh, but we truly appreciate everybody getting on to cover Penn State football. Open up the questions. Uh, we'll start with Rich Starcella from the Reading Eagle, and then we'll go to Audrey Snyder. Rich is muted, guys. It's our first day with Zoom. <laughs> Greg's working on it. Sorry, guys. Give us a second. We're not in the stadium where we normally are. We're in a different – we're in my office, so yeah. some things are a little bit different. I apologize. I'm trying to get Rich unmuted. Oh, Rich. Okay, there it is. Yep. Sorry about that, Rich. No, no problem. James, in light of the news yesterday, uh, in a related matter, what, where do you think uh, minority hiring is in college football? What do you think needs to be done in college football, and how can you be uh, an instrument in, um, in doing that? Yeah, so when you first started, I was like the news yesterday. I wasn't sure where we were going if we are talking recruiting, college football, but but yes. Um, yeah, obviously, the thing that I want to do is, is to set a really good example, right? And the success that we have here hopefully will open more opportunities uh, for guys around the country as well as guys uh, on my staff. Um, you know, I think that's that's the first thing that we can do. But I think the other thing is – you know, when I have the opportunity to be able to introduce coaches to athletic directors uh, and commissioners, uh, and when I have the opportunity to vouch for people, whether it's with search firms or whatever it may be, I have a responsibility with that. You know, I'm pretty proud if you think of the guys that have left here and have gone on to be head coaches. Um, obviously, one of those guys is Charles Huff that was with me at, at both um, Vanderbilt as well as, as Penn State. Um, actually just talked to Charles, you know, maybe a day or two ago. Uh, he have a, he has an opening on his staff. So I was trying to help him with that. Um, but I think that's, I think that's really important. Um, and I think, you know, being willing to have these conversations and be willing to answer the, these questions, um, you know, from a reality standpoint, the fact that it's 2022 and, we're still kind of having these discussions and there hasn't been a whole lot of progress is somewhat crazy. Um, if you really look at from a historical perspective, um, you know, the number of, of uh, coaches of color um, in college football and in the NFL, um, 
you know, is probably concerning, you know, and, and I think the other thing is, you know, when you see some of the things that are going on behind the scenes, as we all witnessed um, yesterday, um, you know, that's concerning as well. Um, you know, I think there's been obviously some policies and some plans to try to help with that. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, those things haven't had a whole lot of, Im- uh, uh, have, have not made uh, much of an impact. So at the end of the day, I think we really got to get down to the core issues and, and why is it, why is it a problem in the first place? You know, so, um, you know, this, this is something that we probably could spend a whole press conference talking on, on Rich, um, you know, but what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to do the very best job that I can at Penn State, and that's not just, you know, winning games and not graduating our players, but also representing the university the right way, uh, hopefully setting an example uh, for others and hopefully opening a few doors that deserve to be opened. David Shaw is a good friend of mine. We talk about these things a lot. Um, I think I think guys like David and others, um, hopefully including myself, uh, could hopefully you know be a part of the change that that needs to happen. Audrey Snyder and then Mark Brennan. Hey, James, happy birthday! Thanks, Audrey. Appreciate it. Um, different note. Um, over the weekend, um, Bryce Mustella had had made some allegations against you and against the program. Um, what is your response to that? And is he still part of the team? Yeah, as you can imagine, you know, when, when, when things like this happen, um, you know, we're we're not really going to have a response. We can't have a response. It's not the appropriate setting uh, to do that. Um, um, and, and I, obviously in this setting, I don't want to get into a whole lot of specifics. You know, the one thing I would say is, you know, he's not currently enrolled. So you can't really be a, a part of a, a, a team unless you're enrolled in classes. Um, but obviously our, our focus is on all of our, all of our student athletes, you know, in the entire athletic department and specifically football uh, is to make sure that our guys are healthy and safe. Um, but you know, that, that's, that's really what I can say at, at this point. Mark Brennan, and then uh, Nate Bauer. Hey, James, thanks for your time today. Hey, Mark, you too. Hey, on the recruiting front, uh, can you talk about how your focus has had to change in January over the last few years from finishing up a current class to you know now having multiple junior days, the portal, all of those things? It seems like a, a completely different animal now than maybe it once was. Yeah, and I'd, I'd probably say the, the the biggest thing is college football's changed dramatically in the last five years, and specifically to probably the last two years. And I think it's a really good example of you know you, you're going to need to be flexible as a football program. You're ne- going to need to be flexible as an athletic department and as a university, um, you know, to make sure that you are positioning your program and your school in the best position you can um, to take advantage of these rules. You know, I think, I think a really good example is our spring semester starts earlier than most. Um, And when, when guys are looking to get into the transfer portal and be somewhere for spring ball, um, we can't use the normal admissions process that's always existed to get a guy in. Um, You know, there's going to have to be some flexibility Um, you know, there was a fairly prominent school, you know, that just, that just got some guys, um, you know, on their campus and in class and they have a similar academic schedule that we have, uh, and they were able to get guys into school, you know? So I just think it's something that, that not only the NCA and the big 10 has to look at, but all these different institutions have to look at as well and say, okay, these are the new rules. These are the new realities and are we willing and what do we need to do to, to position our programs and, and our school um, in the best, in the best light to take advantage of these things. And I think flexibility is, is probably as important as it's, as it's ever been. Um, so I think that's one example of many, but um, I think I've said to you guys before, 
you know, it's interesting. You know, I think a lot of these changes that we've made um, has made the argument for staffs to get bigger rather than smaller um, because there's just too many things that are going on at the same time. You know, taking care of your current roster, um, you know, recruiting high school student athletes, um, you know, looking at the transfer portal and the possibility of, of, of getting some you know, transfers from other universities and schools. I mean, there's some programs that have a complete recruiting department for high school athletes and then have a separate recruiting department uh, strictly for the transfer portal. You know, they're hiring former, um, you know, pro player uh, personnel people from the NFL and, and creating a, a whole department you know, for the transfer portal. So um, I think it's just something that, that we have to understand. College football has changed um, dramatically in the last, you know, obviously even before I got here, um, but it's changed even more over the last five years. And you have to be bold and you have to be aggressive and you have to be flexible. Um, and there has to be a sense of urgency across the board to change and change fast. Nate Bauer, then John Sauber. Hey, James, how are you? Good, Nate. How are you? Good. Hey, um, how close to solidified do you feel like the roster is right now? And um, is there movement left for you uh, in terms of what you're looking for through the transfer portal? Yeah, th there's a little wiggle room. I don't know if, if the word solidified and roster is, is ever going to be, you know, that again, um, you know, under, under the current model. Um, you know, but, but for us, you know, I think it's, it's really important that, you know, we're doing a great job with our, you know, end of the fall meetings with our players and making sure they have a really good understanding of where they're at. <laughs> Obviously I'll do that as well. Um, you know, during the spring. Um, but I, but I do think there's going to be, you know, across, across, you know, the country in college football, um, there's going to be moving parts. And, and that's why I don't know if we can, continue in the same uh, hard cap numbers and um, um, signing numbers in terms of whether it's the hard cap or whether it's initials, we're using a model that was built for college football 20 years ago. And that's really no longer the model. You know, it's, it's changed dramatically. So I think not only there, does there need to be flexibility on these college campuses, mm -hmm. but there needs to be flexibility um, you know, at the Big Ten and NCA level as well, uh, to make sure that we're we're putting our programs in the in the best position to respond. You know, when change happens. John Sauber, then Ben Jones. Hey, James, how are you? Good, John. How are you, buddy? I'm doing good, thanks. Uh, so, with the two additions at quarterback earlier in January, are you still committed to having Sean Clifford as your starter this year, or do you plan on opening up that up a bit more to the other guys on the roster? Yeah, Sean, Sean's our returning starter. You know, there's there's no doubt about that. Um, but yeah, there's competition at, at every position, and you know, obviously, it's it's more challenging. Um, you know, at any position to unseat a returning starter who's been doing it for a couple of years. Uh, but there's competition uh, across the board, uh, across the board at every single position. And you rebuild your team every single year. Um, and there'll be competition at every single, every single position, including the quarterback position. Ben Jones, then Donnie Collins. Hey, James, how's it going? Good, Ben. How are you, man? Good. I got you a broad, open-ended question for your birthday. Um We've talked about the infrastructure changes around the program. We've talked about the philosophical changes around the program that you'd like to see. What do you think you have to get better at? And what do you think you've changed at over the last three years? Yeah, I think it, it kind of goes hand in hand. I think, I think, you know, I, I'm a guy that likes the structure and I like the consistency um, that we've been able to have. Um, I prefer not to have the changes that we've had, uh, but you better embrace them. You know, I think, I think that's something that not only am I preaching um, to the administration and the fans and, and when I answer your guys' questions, but I'm also talking to myself about that as well. Um, you know, whether you totally agree with the transfer portal or whether you totally agree with NIL or whether you totally agree with these things, um, the reality is you have to embrace them. I have to embrace them. 
Um, and then once I've embraced them, I got to do a great job of educating um, and explaining uh, to all the people that have a hand in Penn State football, um, um, whether it's internal to Lash Building or or outside of it, um, that they understand what we're competing against currently. Um, I think we've made you know some dramatic changes. Um, obviously, COVID taught us a lot, um, but I've been able to lean heavily on on guys like Dwight Galt and Brent Pry for for a very long time. I think me and me and Coach Gall have been together, I think, you know, on and off for like 21 years. Um, you know, Brent Pry, we've worked together for 12 years. So, you know, there's change and embracing that change and, and, and kind of be excited about, you know, what, what comes with that. So I think that's probably the biggest thing for me and the program of college football right now is embracing change. And again, I'm preaching to myself on that as much as anything. Um, and then I think it's also having an awareness of what are the core beliefs and values that should never change. Um, you know, that, that these are the things that have allowed us to be successful at Vanderbilt. These are the things that allowed us to come to Penn state, uh, and be successful at Penn state. Um, you know, and, and what's the next step, you know, what, what's the next step. And I think that's the biggest thing that I've talked to you guys about that. I think we're closer to achieving than ever is the alignment you know, the alignment, um, you know, with the board um, and, and all the way down to the head football coach. You know? And and I think that's that's really the next step for us so that we can consistently do what uh, the fans and the alumni and the Letterman want us to do. Donnie Collins and then Neil Rudell. Happy birthday, James. Hey, Donnie. Appreciate it, man. Uh, Tyrese Mills signed today. Um, I, I think the easy thing to do was compare him to Brisker and, and Tig Brown because of where he came from. But what, what do you see from him that kind of is similar to them, but maybe a little bit different in, in regards to what you're looking for at safety? Yeah, we've had a lot of success, obviously, um, you know, with that position specifically, you know, when it comes to, to Lackawanna Junior College and, and what that staff has done over there with, with Coach Duda and Coach Reese and, and Coach Pardini. Um, I think those things have been been you know, helpful, hopefully, to both of our programs. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, so I think, you know, with with Tyrese, we, we saw some similar traits. Right. Uh, you're talking about a guy from the region. He's from Philadelphia Northeast High School um, that has been able to go to Lackawanna and and continue on that path of great safeties that have decided to come to Penn State. Now, one of the things that's great uh, that's a little bit different is, you know, whether you're at Penn State or whether you're at Lackawanna Junior College, that COVID year still has the same impact. So you're talking about getting a junior college guy that has three years of eligibility here, which is tremendous value in that. It's kind of a hybrid high school junior college type player. Um, but I think the biggest thing is, is his physicality. You know, um, you're talking about a guy that I think can play really – you know, in my mind, how I look at it, any three of the safety spots, which is the two deep safeties, but also that field backer slash slash safety player um, you know, that we'd like to play with. I think he has a chance to, to play all three of those spots for us. I think his biggest strength is, is coming downhill and supporting a run like Marcus Allen did as well. Um, you know, but he also has the athleticism and ball skills to make some plays in, in those areas as well. So um, we're excited to get him on campus. I wish he was in a situation like J.B. Nelson that was able to be here, you know, for spring ball. He's not, um, you know, but but, you know, um, we're excited about his potential, we're excited about his future. And again, I think the three years um, of eligibility is significant. Um, hopefully we can you know, get him involved in special teams and get him on the rotation in the back end and just let it build and grow from there from a confidence standpoint. I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm, I'm just enjoying watching Tyler Donahue get his rear end beat right now, um, trying to manage this at the same time. It, it's, it's awesome. So I don't know if you guys are having the opportunity to enjoy this the way I am. I got 125 of them, Tyler. You got one. Let's go. <laughs> uh, we will go Neil Rudell and then Corey Geiger. Hey, James, uh, you and Punksy Phil, 
That's that's exactly. I'm actually talking about going up there a few times and, and being a part of that. But but yeah, obviously, Punksy fills the man. Uh, curious, how much do you think last year set your timetable back of where you expect the program to be, or are you closer than maybe the record showed uh, last year? Yeah, I think you would. I don't want to speak for you, and I think most people would say. Obviously, we were really close last year. Um, you know, we were very, very close, you know, at, at one point ranked number four in the country and, and, and doing some really good things. But I think it's also a great example where depth is, is so important, where development is, is so important, um, you know, because injuries are going to play a factor in, in college football across the board. Um, so, you know, depth is important. Um, some things, you know, going your way are, are important as well. Um, um, and then obviously continuing to build, you know, from an offensive, defense and special team scheme perspective, um, all of it. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's what we do on the field. That's important, but it's also all the things that we do off the field, um, that we're willing to compete in everything year round, which you guys have heard me say for eight years, we have got to be willing to compete year round because all the little losses, that you have throughout the entire calendar year. Um, those add up all the wins that you have throughout the calendar year, they add up. Um, and, and we have to be willing to do those things in all areas year round for us to have the type of success that we want to have consistently. I think obviously we've been, we've been able to show in our time here, what we're able to do. Uh, winning the Big Ten championship before anybody expected us to win a Big Ten championship, uh, having a a record of success uh, and consistency uh, in three New Year's Six Bowl games, I think, in four years, which I don't know if it, it happened before here in the Big Ten era. Um, so I think we've we've shown what we are able to do. We got to get back to that. There's no doubt about it. But we also got to make sure that we're doing all the things that we talk about year round consistently uh, to allow us to do it at a level where Neil, you expect it and the fans and everybody else do as well. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of that, of what the expectations are. That's why we came here. We embrace the extremely high expectations that we have here at Penn state. Um, but I want to make sure that we're doing all the things necessary to compete with the teams that were compared to uh, year round. Corey Geiger and then Mike Porman. James, with regards to Big Ten alignment, what would you like to see? What would be best for Penn State? Two divisions, one division, eight games. Do you know what your – if you could pick your three crossover opponents, fans would like to see probably Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State, but is that would that even really even be best for Penn State? Yeah, I, I, think, it's, I think it's what you have to look at in my mind is you have to look at not just what's best for, for Penn State, what, what's in the best interest of the Big Ten. I would, I would say that some of the decisions that we have made uh, from a scheduling perspective um, were not in the best interest in the Big Ten. You know, um, the way the alignment um, was, was made has not been in the, biz, the best interest of the Big Ten. History shows that. If you look at, you know, whether it's the BCS or you look at the college football playoff, um, some of the decisions that we have made and the structure um, that, that, that we have uh, in terms of all the way back to the decision of playing nine conference games when other conferences decide to stay at eight, um, you'd make the argument from a historical perspective, they have not been in the best interest of, of the Big Ten. Um, you know, right now, if you look at the way the conference is divided, which is very different, even from, I think, when Billy was here um, with the legends and the leaders um, is different. And, and not only is, is I think that probably not in the best interest of, of some of the individual institutions, it's also not in the best interest of the Big Ten. And I think all the data data would support that. Um, one of the things I think has been said from time to time is, well, it all balances out over time. Uh, again, the history and the data doesn't show that. Um, you know, so I think it's something uh, that I think uh, you know the commissioner Kevin Warren um, and I think the Big Ten is probably more open to 
discussing uh, than ever before. Um, but I, I think those are the things, Corey, that, that need to be discussed at that level, uh, big picture. And I think that's one of the things I think you have to be careful of, Corey. And we try to do this at the same thing at, at the national level with the American Football Coaches Association that I think you have to be careful when you're only making decisions based on what's bed for, best for your institution. You never get anything done that way because everybody's just doing what's in their best interest. And you really have to say, okay, what's in the best interest of the Big Ten? And I think if you do that more times than not, it's going to be the right thing for the individual institutions as well, more times than not. The, the, one, one thing I'd like to add, I'm sorry, Chris, before we move on, um, is is just so you guys know, um, we can now announce officially uh, Vega Ioni is 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 uh, signed in our class as well. Uh, a six foot four, 330 offensive lineman out of Graham, Washington, Graham uh, Capelson uh, High School and Coach Curl out there. Um, you know, really excited as a young man that came on campus on an official visit with his mom, brother, and sister. Uh, he's one of nine uh, children. Uh, he's the youngest of nine children. Um, you know, you're talking about, you know, you're talking about a guy that, you know, was part of a state championship team this year as well. Uh, a guy that we think is going to physically have the opportunity to come in and compete uh, early on in his career. Um, but uh, talking about another high level offense lineman that played for a really, really good high school. Um, and, and obviously from an academic perspective too, is a great fit for Penn state. So uh, he chose to go all the way across the country and come to Penn state. And, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that once he announced publicly, uh, that we would announce him on here as well and, and make sure that, that you guys were aware of that as soon as possible. So, um, thanks, Chris. No problem. Uh, Mike Parman and then Mike Gross. Yeah, speaking of Mike Gross uh, and Neil and Richie, welcome to the Over 50 Club, James. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. It, like literally, I remember I think when I was at Vanderbilt, I was like one of the youngest coaches in, in college football and major college football. And I don't know what happened, but that's not the case anymore. Um, it's It's changed. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm at 50. I, I don't know how I feel about that yet, Mike, maybe you and Neil and the guys have some advice for me. Um, but, but I'm not sure how I feel about that. Yeah. 50 is a new 40. Poindexter had a pretty good line this morning when we were in here early getting coffee. Poindexter goes, it beats the alternative. You know? Uh, so I, I'll, I'll take that. There you go. Hey, you're certainly aware of what Grambling and what Ohio State recently did in Texas. Is Penn State where it needs to be with NIL institutionally? And what can be done there? And then kind of a parallel question. If you've met with Neely, have you told her what your one or two top priorities are? Yeah, so um, with name, image, and likeness, this is something that we've been pushing on and, and talking about for two years um, in the football building, this was brought up, um, you know, two years ago, um, that we needed to have a plan and be aggressive and be bold, uh, with this area, um, compared to the, the programs that you have mentioned, uh, we're not there yet. I do think we have an unbelievable opportunity at Penn state with our alumni base, uh, and our brand and our, and our national reputation. Um, I think we have tremendous opportunities, you know, with the education, um, you know, that our young men get and the foundation that our men and women leave Penn State with and the number of really, really successful alumni that we have, we have to take advantage of that and we have to be bold and we have to be aggressive and we have to embrace it. Um, I'd love to see us being on the, the front end um, and being the leader uh, nationally in these, these areas, um, but, but we're not there yet. Uh, there's, that's, that's clear and that's obvious. Um, we have some work to do. Um, but yeah, I would, I'd love to see us, um, like the schools that you mentioned, um, that us be, that we are bold and aggressive in these areas and flexible. And when these new rules are put in place, we have to move and we have to move quickly. Uh, that there's, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, when it comes to 
conversations with our with our new president. Um, I think the first thing is I think uh, our new president has been very very respectful um, of President Barron and and you know make sure that that transition is is smooth. Um, and obviously we have a ton of respect for for Coach Barron and what he's been able to do and our time. You know we came pretty much together to Penn State. Um, you know, so I haven't had a, a sit down conversation uh, with our new president yet. We've had some conversations, but not, you know, in the details that you're talking about. I know that's going to happen, but has not happened yet. Um, uh, so I hope that answers both your questions. For the record, Brett McMurphy, who's not on this call, just tweeted you're the 65, 65th youngest uh, head coach in FBS. So is, is, is that, is that something to brag about? 60? I don't think, I don't think so. I'm just, I'm Brett, just <laughs> Brett McMurphy. I mean, <laughs> how old is he? Where does he rank in age in the writers? <laughs> On that note, we'll go to Mike Gross and then Bob Flounders. We're only taking questions from people 50 years old. Just got to say it on that, on that note, we go to Mike Gross. Exactly. Yeah. I'm the 65th oldest sports writer in Pennsylvania, I guess. Um, James, uh, a couple of things uh, that you've talked about in this recently and in this press conference that I want to try to put a finer point on. Would, would you would you like to um, would you like to? Some schools have done the NIL stuff, kind of farmed it out to somebody to specific people who do that. Would you like to have Penn State have its own sort of department of that? I guess. And the other thing is with the with the portal and and the recruiting stuff. You talked about schools that now have completely separate personnel that do transfer portal and recruiting. Would you like to have that specific change? Yeah. So I, I guess to to answer your question, I, I I think we have to be bold and aggressive. Um, I think we have to sit here and say, okay, here's a rule that's coming. That's going to be a change. And how are we going to take advantage of that rule under the Penn State umbrella um, that everybody is comfortable with and have thorough discussions about it? And then the same thing under the state rules and laws. And then once we do that, which we should be able to do very quickly, then we need to then we need to move and we need to be. Um, one of the leaders in college football. Uh, we need to be one of the leaders in, in college athletics um, and, and, and put some things out there that people can be excited about and that people can get behind and that put our student athletes in the best position and, and put our, um, our individual teams in the best position to be successful and compete year round. We have to be bold and aggressive. And then it's the same thing you're talking about. You know, when it comes to, to name, image, and likeness, again, you have to be bold and aggressive. It, it, Mike, the, the way I would just make the argument, college football is so competitive that there is not an area that you can say, well, we're not going to compete in that area. You, you have to be willing to compete in it, in it all. And I think that's, that's that's the difference. You have to be willing to compete in it all. And, and th again, these are things, guys, that you've been hearing me talk about all the way back to when I first got here. And I remember bringing up facilities and, and some of the media on this call looked at me like I had three heads. You know, you, you got to be willing to compete in, in all of it uh, year round. And, and I think, you know, that's that's what the expectation is. Uh, and I know we're excited about doing it. Bob Flounders, and then we'll wrap it up with Tyler Donahue. Hi, James. Happy birthday. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it, buddy. Uh, feel free to use this to your advantage moving forward. Dave Jones turns 65 in April. If you want to use that at any time, use that to your advantage. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to... I, I don't somebody, wanna... somebody tweet that to Dave Jones. <laughs> I know I'm going to hear about it. Um, I wanted to just go back to the second half of, of last season and not, you know, belabor the obvious, but um, your running game had its share of struggles. But I, I thought there were times, James, 
during the second half of the season after games where I don't know if you were frustrated, but you said we, I, you weren't really satisfied maybe with the commitment to the run game in the game. And maybe that could actually help take some pressure off some other areas, other areas of your offense. Is that, is that accurate? Number one. And is that a kind of a commitment to be more commit committed to the running game, maybe in 2022, especially with the two talented runners that you're bringing in that enrolled in January? Yes. Uh, I, I think there's no doubt about it. We, we have to be able to throw to win games. We have got to be able to run to win games. And there's going to be games where the run needs to be the emphasis. If you're playing a team and they're dropping eight, I think you saw it in the second half of the Chiefs game. You know, if, if, if they're going to drop eight, that makes that makes throwing the ball more challenging. And you got to be able to run. Uh, I remember I remember in the I remember in the, the Cotton Bowl game, you know, sitting there and saying we got an opportunity right now to run the ball, you know, and, and committing to that during the game making that shift and, and running for a bunch of yards. I think we rushed for over 300 yards. I think, you know, journey rushed for 250. Um, you know, so it's all of it. And, and we, we're going to be games where we're going to need to run the ball to win. There's going to be games where we need to throw the ball to win. Um, and we have to have the ability to do that uh, throughout a season uh, and throughout games. And yeah, I, I think if you, if you look at the bowl game, we got away from the run. Um, and, and we, we should have run the ball more. We were having success doing it and, and we should have done that. And that, that's part of my responsibility as well, um, in the off season studies, um, and making sure that we're committed to doing that during spring ball, that we're committed to doing that during the summer and that we're committed to doing that during the year. And I think that's also my job, you know, during games as well. You know, I'd have conversations with Brent pride during the game where I felt like we needed to be more aggressive or call coverage or whatever it may be. And the same thing on offense. Um, you know, we need to, we need to push the ball down the field here and take a shot. You know, we need to run the ball more. Um, I think that's where I can help, um, you know, as the head coach. So yeah, you know, I, there's a lot of things that you look back after games, whether it's the NFL or whether it's college or high school, you look back after games and you say, um, you know, we weren't as good in this area and we need to be better in this, in this area, uh, at, after a game and you learn from that and you try to adjust during the season. There's things you look back uh, at the end of the season and say, okay, you know, here, here's a strength, here's a weakness. We need to work hard on, on, on getting this weakness fixed and resolved. And then I think there's also a little bit, you know, with the run game where you have to be patient. You, know, you have to be patient with it, you know, um, throwing the ball and explosive plays and the excitement, you know, that comes with the, the way college football has, has really um, evolved as well as the NFL. Um, if you're not careful, you become, you become too throw, throw heavy. And I just want to make sure that we have the ability to do both. And that's through development of our players. That's through recruiting. That's through scheme. Uh, that's through fundamentals that that's through all of it. And that will be an emphasis this spring. This, that will be an emphasis this summer and, and next season as well. We'll wrap it up. We'll wrap it up with Tyler Donahue uh, and Olivia. It's Olive, Chris, but I, I, I have Olive, been, my bad. Olivia, I think was the most popular girl's name in 2021. So that's fine. Um, James, Thank happy you. birthday. Um, I, I, I want to ask about two players uh, that are new to your roster, one that's already on the roster, one that you just announced to us. Um, Vega, how did that come together in such a short time period? And what does that commitment and signing, I guess, show uh, a trust reciprocated on both sides in a short period? And then Mitchell Tinsley put up crazy numbers last year at Western Kentucky. He's now on campus with you. Um, what stood out about him bringing him onto the team? And what are your expectations for his year with your program? Yeah, so I think the first thing with with Mitchell is, you know, um, it was pretty cool. I met the American Football Coaches Association, and I think I was standing there in the lobby with with Taylor Stubblefield, and this guy comes up to us, and it's Mitchell Tinsley's coach from Western Kentucky, and he could not have gone on and on and on about more positive things about that young man. Um, and as you know, when, when guys transfer, that's not always the case. And, you know, this guy just could not have been more positive. You know, he had decided he was going to the transfer portal. 
They had asked him to play in the bowl game anyway. He played in the bowl game. You know, obviously had a big year. Um, and that's what we've seen since we, you know, have gotten him on campus. You know, um, the strength staff has been really impressed by him. Sean Clifford, who I think is his roommate, has been really impressed with him. I think we've done a really good job of these guys in the transfer portal, not just checking out their film, but doing extensive background checks and calling around all the way back to high school coaches and college coaches to make sure we understand what we're getting. It's amazing how often that's not happening. You know, guys that, that are getting signed by other schools and no one's ever called and checked on them at the previous institution, which is concerning to me. Um, but you know, obviously that gives us a veteran guy with Jahan leaving. Um, Jahan obviously was extremely productive. Mitchell was very, very productive as well. Gives us an older guy. We think we got some really talented young receivers as well, but this gives us an older veteran presence. Who's had a lot of production in that room. Uh, so I think there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of value for both parties there, you know, and then when it comes to Vega, you know, just really pretty cool, you know, um, Stacy Collins has got history, you know, obviously in that part of that country, specifically recruiting, uh, has got some relationships out there. So I think that played a part in this. Uh, Taylor Stubblefield is also from the state of Washington. My wife is from the state of Washington, coached out there. And so we were able to reach out and connect and there was interest. Uh, I think early on, it may have just been a trip, you know, but there was some interest came out on the trip, really liked our guys uh, our guys do a great job when these guys come on campus of kind of getting a feel for our culture and, you know, kind of see how we interact with each other and, and, and really telling them the truth, uh, which I think is really important. It, it, it typically, you know, recruiting is usually sealed by the players and how they make the recruits feel when they're on campus. Um, you know, obviously, you know, coach Troutwine did a good job going out there as well and, and connecting with this young man and his family I was shocked. You know, a lot of times you see guys on film and you're not really sure what they're going to look like in person. And he showed up here and he was 336 pounds and carried it as well as anybody I've ever seen. Probably looked like he was 295. Um, and you look at his athleticism on tape and, and, his, and his, how quick his feet were and how light he was on his feet. Um, you know, just really impressed. I also love the fact, I also love the fact that he comes from a winning program. Uh, I think that that was a big deal as well. And then the, just the more I find out about this guy, the more I like, uh, Stacy, I don't know if you're able to unmute, uh, but, but Stacy, you know, brought up this morning, uh, that I think he's student body president as well. Is that right, Stacy? I can't hear Stacy, Chris. So Stacy unmuted, but something was going on there. Stacy. No, it's not working. Um, We're having a issue, apparently. Let's go check. Okay. We may have to change computers there, but just the more I find out about them, the more I like them. Um, again, the mom came out on the trip. The brother came out on the trip. The sister came out on the trip. That was awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to make a trip and, and fly out there on a Sunday and spend the afternoon with their family and high school coach as well. I think that's important. Um, but I just think he felt like a fit. You know, the last time we did this, it worked out pretty well with Koa Farmer went all the way out to California. I remember when Koa came on his trip, they landed in Philadelphia. It was a snowstorm. They got stuck and had to drive from Philly up to state college through the snow. And I'm like, there's no way in heck we're getting this kid. And it worked out well. Um, so as you guys know, we'd like to recruit a little bit more nationally um, and getting a guy like Vega to come in here. Hopefully that will help. He'll come here and have a great experience and, and hopefully be able to go back and get a few more guys. So, um, you know, we're, we're really excited about him at a position of need. I think Chris lost her wingman and Greg who ran down to another office. So um. he, he did, but my internet also just died in the middle. So we're having all kinds of good times, but thank you very much coach. And we'll, uh, we'll start with Stacy Collins here in just one moment. 